Thanks, Mr. President. This bill marks the beginning of what we understand will be months of parliamentary debate on national security legislation. Today, an expansion of ASIO's intrusion and surveillance powers, perhaps next sitting, the question of Australians travelling to the civil war in Syria and the continuing war of terror in Iraq. And then perhaps national mandatory data retention laws entrenching the infrastructure of passive surveillance over everyone in the country. And after that, we'll see. One thing we know we won't be voting on in here is the Prime Minister's split-second decision to deploy the ADF back into war in Iraq, even though that open-ended commitment profoundly shapes the context in which this debate takes place. I want to begin, as I suspect everyone in this debate will begin, with unconditional and unequivocal condemnation of the medieval barbarity of this entity that calls itself Islamic State. One of the founding principles of the Australian Greens is nonviolence, and we condemn without reservation this organisation that has raised the bar on violence in an already violent part of the world. Now, I understand that because of this government's cynical and unpopular standing in the Australian community, questions have been raised as to the motives and the timing behind the government's sudden array of national security measures. But for me, these questions are secondary. No government, coalition, Labor, Green, wants to suffer an act of terrorism against the Australian community on its watch. No one, no matter what their politics, wants to look back in the aftermath of a violent attack in a familiar place and realise that there were things that we should have done to better protect our community. And until shown otherwise, I want to assume that it is this imperative that principally motivates the government. What I will strongly question is whether the government understands just how counterproductive some of its initiatives are. I understand that some of these initiatives seem to make tactical sense in the very short term, but before I get into debate on the specifics of this bill, I want to look at the steps that we've taken to get here today. In the aftermath of the indiscriminate attacks on 9-11, Australia pledged its support to a global war on terror. At the tip of the spear, we joined military invasions of Afghanistan in 2001 and Iraq in 2003 that sought to obliterate al-Qaeda and the Taliban regime and depose the dictator Saddam Hussein. Our ground stations at places like Pine Gap have supported targeted drone assassinations of suspected terrorist figures and everyone in their immediate vicinity in any country in which the US chooses to conduct them. Across the Five Eyes Alliance of Intelligence Agencies, Australia has supported the development of high-resolution, real-time surveillance of the entire population, militarising the entire internet in the process. Every few years, the powers of police and intelligence agencies are expanded and widened to fight this war on terror, and every time we surrender some of our hard-fought for freedoms, we're told to accept in good faith that these expanded powers are needed to keep us safe. Detention without charge, sedition laws, Hundreds of billions of dollars have been spent as we fight this war on terror, with kill teams, laser-guided bombs and drone strikes. Fire has been met with fire. As a result, hundreds of thousands of innocent people have been killed in Afghanistan, Iraq, Yemen, Somalia, Pakistan and places far from here. Hundreds of thousands of men, women and children. And these are people with names and family histories and stories that most of us will never hear. Every one of these casualties of the war on terror is a human tragedy, every bit as real as the tragedy that befell the Sari Club or downtown Manhattan now more than a decade ago. So what do we have to show for our series of tactical decisions to fight violence with violence and to militarise civilian communications channels? The terror networks that we tried to smash have morphed and grown and spread to the point where we are now in a more precarious state than before. The death of Osama bin Laden at the hands of US Special Forces three years ago appears to have had no discernible <coughs> impact on the spread or capability of extremist networks. A fundamentalist army built on oil money and stolen American weapons now occupies a huge swathe of Iraq and Syria and an expanding online audience. As we join yet another military coalition in the Middle East, Australian government representatives themselves now believe that the threat is higher than ever before. So on a day such as today, with the latest legislative upgrades to the war on terror on the table before us, we need to evaluate whether the arc of our response to terrorism in the last decade and a half is in fact making everyone less safe. Rather than national security, which has come to imply militarisation abroad 
and a stepwise erosion of precious freedoms here at home, while the state steadily increases its powers of surveillance and coercion, perhaps it is time to start speaking of community safety, human security, community resilience and de-radicalisation. And it is why the Australian Greens will not be writing blank checks to the surveillance state. It's because it doesn't make us safer. In times of heightened security, civil liberties like privacy or freedom of speech are more vital than ever. And so that is why we believe, and I join my comments to those by Senator Collins, to a fully funded independent national uh, security monitor. And what this monitor did, and it was a cross-party initiative introduced, I think at the time of the Rudd government, supported and amended by the Australian Greens, and I can well remember the day that Senator Brandis, might have been the last time it happened, supported Australian uh, Greens' amendments to make the monitor more independent of the Prime Minister's office. And it was one of those occasions, I argued that it had been long delayed, when the parliament did its job and that at last we had an office that would assess whether the counter-terrorism legislation and national security legislation that exists on the statute books in this country was necessary, proportionate, was it actually keeping us safe. And the work of that monitor in subsequent years was almost completely ignored uh, by both the government and opposition of the day. And if you take the time to read those reports, you will discover that, in fact, uh, the powers that did sit and do still sit on the statute books, uh, many of them are considered to be dangerous or obsolete. And that is why I think we're, not, we're simply not learning from history. And I strongly condemn the decision of the government as part of its arbitrary uh, attack on the budget in knocking over the national security legislation monitor, as Senator Collins said, as part of red tape removal. What on earth were you thinking? And so I understand that we have an agreement, probably a handshake agreement, that that monitor's office should resume. The office is unoccupied. Nobody's there at the moment. Senator Brandis is a full member and, I understand, a diligent member of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, signed off on a report last year that said this very bill that we're debating today should be put first into the field as an exposure draft, which it wasn't, and secondly, that the uh, National Security Legislation Monitor should be given the opportunity to assess it, which should be cute, except that that office is currently vacant and unoccupied. And so when we hear, and I'm sure we will hear coalition speakers, I hope we will hear coalition speakers during this debate, talk of the need to balance uh, privacy, civil rights against the needs of security. I believe it's a false construct and a false balance that's described. Uh, but at least um, I'm presuming you'll make a rhetorical flourish in that direction. A very important part of that balance is having an operating national security legislation monitor whose work is listened to and incorporated into the debate. It's not um, to deny, obviously, the important role that our police and security agencies play in disrupting these networks, but I call the senator's attention to uh, an interview that Glenn Greenwald, um, who published many of the revelations of Edward Snowden, uh, um, documents that, that exposed huge illegalities at the heart of the surveillance state in the United States, had said if these powers were being used solely in pursuit of terror networks and organised crime networks, we wouldn't be having this conversation. We wouldn't need to be having this conversation. The fact that they are applied so indiscriminately—and we'll get to a debate on data retention if the government is so bold as to bring a bill forward, so I won't dwell on it here today—is that it is utterly indiscriminate. It is the opposite of targeted and proportional. I also want to uh, point out—and I'm not sure whether Senator Collins was aware of it or not—that the Amendments that the government uh, has allegedly drafted to, in response to the Parliamentary Joint Committee's uh, report, which was tabled last week, have not yet been circulated to this chamber, and that all senators, government, opposition and crossbench are now debating a bill that we haven't read. We have not been given the courtesy of even seeing the government's amendments to a bill. If this bill was trivial, that would be bad manners. But on a bill as important as this, I say you are treating us with contempt. You are treating your own backbenchers with contempt, or anybody who might come in here uh, with a will to do with due diligence the job that we were sent here to do, whatever our political um, affiliations, that you have asked us to come in here and debate a bill that we haven't read. That is treating us with contempt. 
Um, we rang, um, I should put on the record, the Attorney General's office an hour or so ago to find out whether he was going to do the Chamber the courtesy of tabling the amendments at least before the debate began. We were told they'd be tabled half an hour or so ago. Quite obviously, that hasn't occurred. The two main issues that I'll raise and speak of um, in more detail when we get to the committee stage, um, I've got very, uh, very strong concerns about the whole regime of special intelligence uh, operations that throw an additional uh, blanket over the operations of an agency that already, I guess by definition and under its act, operates under conditions of great obscurity. I understand why that is the case, but any proposal that comes in here to further uh, make further even more opaque the operations of these agencies and to do things like propose complete immunity, almost complete immunity, to breaking the law, which is where I think Senator Lanhelm's concerns around terrorism originated. But wide scope for misbehaviour, and it's impossible for this parliament to know uh, whether these powers are being abused or not. It's already very difficult to tell, and we, t we tend to find out in the aftermath, uh, as in the case of um, Mr Hanif or Mr Ulhaq or any of the other instances where, uh, in, in retrospect, you look back and realise that ASIO's powers had in fact been abused because they are just people, recognising that they operate very tightly circumscribed by an act of parliament. But nonetheless, the work of oversight committees or groups like the Legislation Monitor are essential in a democracy, uh, and these powers and these oversights are there for a reason. So I have strong concerns, but the issues upon which um, I've circulated amendments are effectively in two areas. Firstly, and this was something that the uh, Joint Committee picked up, and I believe the government has chosen to ignore its advice, uh, is that the definition of a computer for which a warrant apply, will apply, an access warrant will apply, uh, is considered to include uh, computers attached on a network. And as many, many submitters put to the committee and have put to the government directly. This means effectively with a single warrant uh, you could be authorising intrusion onto computers in a network in an unbounded way. Uh, when we get to the committee stage, and Senator Fifield, I know you're here in a representative capacity and this is not your bill, but just to put you on notice, I will be seeking detailed information, unless of course the government consents to the Australian Greens Amendment, which is always a possibility. Uh, where. I know not to get my hopes up, but you, you come in here in an optimistic frame of mind, at least. Um, but I would like to know how the government proposes that these clauses that it's inserted will be interpreted, because a very wide range of, uh, of submitters from the Pirate Party, Electronic Frontiers Australia, all the way up to the Law Council have said it's vastly open-ended to allow a single warrant uh, for a computer system to then arbitrarily extend what does that mean? A premise, an entire building, a university campus, a small town? The internet is a network. It is a network of networks. And I believe the Australian law, particularly on surveillance powers, should recognise that fact. Um, the second issue, which is one which has again exercised the minds of nearly everyone who made a submission uh, in the brief time that the PJCIS was given to evaluate this bill. Um, to the idea that national security reporting becomes criminalised, sharing material on Facebook becomes criminalised explicitly in black letter law in this bill. And that is something that I am appalled that the Attorney General, who falls over himself in interviews to say that he would be the last one to arbitrarily sign off on the coercive powers of the state, and I believe considers himself a true liberal in the original sense of the word, would allow the criminalisation of reporting. Uh, of this material. So we have serious concerns, and I again, just uh, Senator Fifield, for your benefit when we come to the committee stage, uh, will be very, very interested to know how the Australian government can justify clauses that criminalise um, reporting uh, or unauthorised disclosure of, of, uh, of some of these matters. Because we have seen from experience overseas, uh, principally in the United States, that national security whistleblowing and the protection of public interest whistleblowing, and I'm not talking about espionage, but public interest whistleblowing is an essential component of keeping some of these agencies honest. I want to conclude um, with some, some thoughts again on, on safety 
and on community safety, as opposed to the government's frame of national security, which always seems to imply increasing militarisation and increasing the coercive powers of the state. If we are actually serious about keeping people safe and de-radicalising uh, and, and prevention rather than cleaning up horrific messes after they've occurred, understanding that that is partly the mandate of the policing agencies and the intelligence agencies is, by definition, preemptive. Uh, if you are cleaning up after a mess, I understand that that is considered as a failure and it is not something that anybody wants to see on their watch, whatever your politics. The other way, of course, apart from raising and increasing coercive surveillance powers for preventing these attacks in the first place, apart from taking a long, hard look at well over a decade of Australian foreign policy, is to keep our own house in order. Um, anybody um, who watched Q&A last night would have seen a presentation by Dr Anne Arley where she spoke, I think, briefly of the People Against Violent Extremism organisation that she's a part of and some of the community and family de-radicalisation work that she has been engaged in. On the proverbial smell of an oily rag, not a great deal of resources of the tens and ultimately hundreds of millions of dollars that are being hurled from, from this government towards national security objectives, which I understand. What about community safety? What about prevention where it really matters? These initiatives, um, a, a symposium in Perth in 2013 um, titled Countering Violent Extremism, the Australian government doesn't actually have to look very far because some of it was funded under the former government. Some of the funding, a trickle, still remains is that we have, at a pilot scale, excellent initiatives built on work uh, done in Germany and done in other parts of the world, because Australia obviously is not alone in confronting these issues. Um, but to consider, um, just to give you one metric, $13.4 million in Australia uh, is dedicated to preventing young Australians from being caught up in these violent networks, which operate um, almost as, as violent organised crime networks, which is 0.5 per cent, roughly, of the government's counter-terrorism package. Now, this has an important place in community safety, the de-radicalisation and the prevention in the first place, which I understand everybody in here is interested in and has an interest in, needs resourcing. I know it's not as uh, dramatic, and it might not get you on the front page of the Daily Telegraph tomorrow but it is an essential part of preventing, these, uh, preventing further spread of violence. Cutting $11 million to the Building Multicultural Communities Program, just really dumb. Cutting the National Security Legislation Monitor, unforgivable. Cutting humanitarian foreign aid and cutting our humanitarian refugee intake, zeroing earlier this year our foreign aid contribution to Iraq, which we helped demolish. You know, these are decisions that actually come back to bite us. These are things that matter. People notice. Um, Senator, if, you, if you're free to contradict me when you get time to jump to your feet, if Order. we still have any—I did take the, uh, the interjection, uh, Deputy Chair—but if we still make any actual humanitarian foreign aid contribution to Iraq, I'd be very keen to see it in the budget papers, uh, because it has gone from quite a substantial commitment in the aftermath of the war to approximately zero. And so, um, colleagues, the Australian Greens will not be supporting this bill. I look forward to getting some information from the government when we come to the committee stage as to uh, exactly how it proposes to justify a radical expansion of powers, what has come to seem almost like the annual expansion of ASIO's surveillance powers, uh, to, I would say, a somewhat sceptical change.